My name is Paul Delosh. I'm the Director of Judicial Services at the Administrative Office of the Courts, Supreme Court of Virginia. And I am joined by Michelle O'Brien. And you can see all of our names and, and titles up, up there. Principal Court Management Consultant for the National Center for State Courts. Don Jacobson, Senior Special Projects Consultant with the Arizona Supreme Court. And we have Greg Lambard, who is the trial court administrator for the Superior Court of New Jersey, the um, Middlesex vicinage. And we have our um, great host today, and he was standing at the door. And um, hopefully you all picked up this uh, press release when you came in today. So a couple of housekeeping things. This session is being recorded and live streamed. and. The panelists, and, and I welcome questions along the way. If you have a question that you want to ask as we're going through, please feel free to raise your hand, but wait for Luke to get to you with the microphone so that we can pick it up on the live stream as well on the recording as well. So again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. As many of you know, mental illness has touched nearly every family in America in one way or another. And recent reports suggest that the pandemic has only exacerbated the situation. And it's not just for adults, but young people and children as well. And despite the high prevalence of mental illness in society, in our society, there's often um, you know, problems and where we have um, we inadequately equipped to address those with behavioral health needs. And many courts have implemented a number of successful programs, implemented uh, policy changes and procedure changes, and some have even instituted some significant reform efforts. But really, it's all upon all of us on a state and local court basis to lead and promote systemic changes from the court and the communities in addressing behavioral health needs in our community. So again, um, you were handed this press release uh, when you came in. Every year, NACOM is presented with a number of topics that will be the subject of their guide. It's on a topic of national importance to the court community. And that's actually through the NACOM Communication Committee. And in 2021, the NACOM board was presented with a number of topics for a consideration for their 2022 guide. And the focus on behavioral health and the courts really rose to the top as far as the subject matter. And so as a result, the NACOM behavioral health guide was created. And all of us up here today were part of a larger work group that worked on preparing the guide for the court community. And again, I want to refer back to what was handed out when you came in. And that is actually NACOM's press release for the behavioral health guide. And on it, we actually put a URL and a QR code that you can access and download the NACOM Behavioral Health Guide. And it is free of charge to NACOM members, and there's a nominal charge for those that are non-members. And for those of us that are jo joining remotely, virtually, or for those that might be viewing this presentation later than this live uh, performance here today, you can go to the NACOM website, nacomnet.org, and in the search function, you go to the NACOM store, go to guides, and then you'll see all of the NACOM guides that are available to the court community. They're in alphabetical order. So you can actually download from there. So again, a great resource for you. You all see on the screen the uh, definition of insanity, and some of you might be familiar with that being attributed to Albert Einstein in that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, but expecting different results. And in many ways, that really sums up our behavioral health system in our country and highlights the need for systemic changes to actually fix it. And what we all see are that the provision of services and, and treatment is, is often dysfunctional and in many places non-existent. So throwing money at the situation alone 
won't solve the issue. It really takes a comprehensive approach and a comprehensive overhaul to fix the system. And so there is a 2020 documentary entitled The Definition of Insanity, and it explored the groundbreaking work of the Miami-Dade Mental Health Project, and it was an approach that was really heralded as, the, um, as a way to address the mental health crisis in the country. And it was championed by a judge that many of you know, Judge Steve Leifman, obviously, in, in Florida. So I just want to show you a trailer from that particular documentary series. For those that are interested in seeing the entire documentary, it's a PBS video series, and it follows a team of really dedicated public servants that are working through the courts to steer people that um, are incarcerated and steer them to recovery as their court case really hangs in the balance. So let me go ahead and play this short video clip for you. 11 years ago, I was in jail on the ninth floor in the Dade County Jail. I'm laying in a pile of feces, vomit, and urine. I'm sick, I'm hearing voices, I'm seeing things, and they're like, oh, we'll put you on the psych floor. Thank goodness. Some, pe <laughs> some people that understand me. If I get up there, it's, it's way worse, man. Last year, about 1.5 million people with serious mental illnesses were arrested. Our jails have become the largest public psychiatric institutions in the country. We were spending $80 million a year to warehouse people in conditions that you wouldn't let your dog stay in. We know how to fix it. It's a question of political will and leadership. It's foolhardy what we do now, and it's cool because we're not affording people the opportunity for recovery. We have this amazing program with amazing people that could help keep you out of here. I mean, I'd like to do that. I always had a normal life. After I had this whole schizophrenia thing, I didn't know what was going on. It's real psychological, psychological warfare. He was looking at five years minimum. They just needed to diagnose him. And this kid has a total different life. Oh man, my ankle feels a little lighter. I'm in recovery. Yeah. Drugs, alcohol, oh, mental health. You know, I've said stuff to people and they'll go before the judge. Man, this boy crazier than me. Why am I listening to him? <laughs> No, 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 I don't want to go. We're here to help you out. What's he facing? I have approximately 45 years state prison. See how you can look picture perfect, and then all of a sudden, within a minute, everything could just collapse. Ooh, get Give him a seat. Give him a seat. I have mental illness that's going on within me, so I try my best every day. That's all I can do. We are increasing the quality of life for our community and for our clients. There's no doubt. Be proud of yourself. Be proud of you. They're just people and they want to do everything that everybody else wants to do. They want to be happy, they want to have dreams. So now we have a totally different system. They're just people. They want to do everything that everyone else does. They want to be happy and productive. So that really tells a telltale sign of what we are working with and how we are challenged in today's America. Working in the court system, all of us use data to support and inform policy decisions. And unfortunately for many of us related to behavioral health, we don't have sufficient data. Sometimes we don't even have data at all to help us inform, again, some suggestions for changing the system. And just to give you an example of some of the data challenges, you know, following a, a competency restoration and the number of individuals that are waiting for a restoration bed, how many individuals, how long have they been waiting for that bed? So we therefore look outside of the court system for data. We look to jails, for example. We look to the behavioral health system to, to look for data that can help us measure how common mental illness is and the populations that are affected by mental illness. And using that data so we can assess the, the physical and the social and the financial impact that relates. So knowing such 
data really provides all of us some powerful tools in raising public awareness, breaking down the stigma that is often associated with those with behavioral health challenges, and advocating for better health and even policy changes within our own court system. As I had said, millions of people are impacted by mental illness. And here you see that we have one in five individuals, approximately 53 million people having a mental illness. And when we talk about serious mental illness, someone who has been diagnosed with a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder that caused some functional impairment that substantially interferes or, or even limits their major life activities, as you can see here is also prevalent with one in 20 people or over 14 million people diagnosed with a serious mental illness. And over half of chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14. Three quarters by the age of 24. It's been reported that approximately 70% of juveniles with behavioral health disorders wind up in our criminal justice system. And courts have reported that 90% of those individuals too, of those juveniles, have been impacted by some form of trauma. So in the court system, and that specific statistic alone, we can look at knowing the impact of trauma so that we can have that heightened awareness to champion changes in our system. And many individuals who develop substance use disorders are also diagnosed with mental health disorders or vice versa. Dual diagnosis or co-occurring disorders of both mental health disorder and substance use disorder are, are common. And we can see here in 2020, over 68 million American adults had mental illness or a substance use disorder. Looking further at those numbers, over 20 million adults had a substance use disorder, over 14 million had serious mental illness, and 5.7 million adults had both a serious mental illness and a substance use disorder. And we look at those numbers as diagnosis of these dual diagnoses is really key and it's really critical in identifying treatment for individuals that have both behavioral health and substance use disorders. And as we further see, those with co-occurring disorders complicate their involvement with the justice system and their access to care. As we see here, about two thirds of adults age 18 or older with a co-occurring disorder in the past year received either treatment for their mental health or substance, uh, um, substance use disorder. But astonishingly, only 9.3% received treatment for both. Through research, we know that people with mental illness in the United States are 10 times more likely to be incarcerated than they are to be hospitalized. Those who don't end up in the prison system are likely to cycle repeatedly through patchy psychiatric care, spells of homelessness, and even emergency room visits. And every year, about 1.5, and it's really closer to 1.7 million individuals um, are arrested with mental illness. And you can see a quote here back to Judge Leifman where he's really referencing that jails and prisons, and even the courts are the, uh, are the repository of failed public policy. And such failed public policy has resulted in mass incarceration with jails becoming the country's de facto mental health care system. So as people experiencing mental illness are disproportionately, disproportionately likely to encounter law enforcement, we know that it does not result in appropriate medical care, but rather it results in their overrepresentation within the criminal justice system. And it's the same for substance use disorders. So here we see people in custody who reported symptoms consistent 
with substance use disorder with 68% in jails, 53% in state prisons, and 46% in uh, federal prisons. So really no surprise as with those with substance use disorder that there's a significant overrepresentation of mental illness in jails as well. The rate, as you can see here, of mental illness is four to six times higher in jail than in the general population. And while not shown here, those with serious mental illness is two to four times higher. This represents a large portion of the United States correctional population. And as we look at this data further and look at the breakdown by gender, we know historically that the population of women that are incarcerated is about 7%. But we see the makeup of those incarcerated by gender with 14% being male and 31% female, which pose additional challenges in the way that we provide services and treatment. And in comparison between the general population to the jail population, we see a significant difference highlighted here. Of the general population, we see that 4% with being uh, diagnosed with a serious mental illness. When we look at the jail population, we actually see 17% with serious mental illness and 72% have co-occurring disorders. So unfortunately, cultural dynamics and past public um, choice, policy choices made many individuals with serious mental illness much worse. But the great thing is we now know from experience that proper treatment works. Reform should begin by tackling behavioral and substance abuse disorders, not as criminal behavior, but for what they are, illnesses. And arrest and incarceration should be the very last resort for people with serious mental illness and behavioral health challenges. We need to apply a public health model to the criminal justice system rather than a criminal justice model to behavioral health needs. So in moving forward, let me turn it over to Michelle, who will take a look at the current landscape of the current um, practices and procedures that are in place now to identify and divert and address the needs of those with behavioral health issues. So let me turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Paul. Um, as you can see um, from all of this information, um, the justice system has increasingly become the default system for addressing the needs of those with behavioral health issues, even though this is a system that is not designed to do this. Um, we need to take a hard look at our current practices and ensure what we are doing is using evidence-based practices. Um, we need to identify, divert, and address the needs of those with behavioral health issues. Um, so taking a look at this current landscape, um, what do we currently have? What is the structure that we can use to look at that current landscape? Um, part of this work also with the Snake and Behavioral Health Guide, um, there's also a national judicial task force um, for mental illness that um, has been discussing this work as well. Uh, two of the things that have been published as part of that um, are leadership guides. We know that judges taking leadership positions to move this effort forward makes a difference. People come to those meetings and that we need them to be champions to move these efforts forward. These are two resources that do exist um, for you and can be found within links of the NACOM Behavioral Health Guide. So when looking at this, um, how many of you have ever heard of the sequential intercept model? Excellent. How many have been actually involved in doing a sequential intercept mapping workshop? Yay. Um, so this behavioral health guide is structured around the sequential intercept model, looking at how people receive services within the community and enter and move through our criminal justice system. 
um, ways to uh, keep them in the system, to re uh, in the community to reserve, receive services, but then also how to early identify and deflect and divert people from our system, um, away from our system, to the appropriate treatments that we have. One thing that we have to keep in mind too is that when looking at this, this isn't just about our criminal justice system. This is about our entire justice system in all types of criminal cases. Even though this is arranged around the adult system, we need to keep thinking about how all of these things interact with each other. Meaning, we have someone that comes into our criminal justice system for an arrest. It may involve other types of courtrooms as well. Is, does it involve families? And does it involve a child welfare courtroom? Does it involve child custody or divorce matters? Are there different orders of protection in each of those courtrooms? Thinking about how we make this system a person-centered system to actually address the needs of those who come into our system, not just dividing it up how we have divided up, but making it make sense and useful for those that we are trying to help and support. So let's look at these different intercepts. There are six of them, intercepts zero through five. Um, the goal of intercept one is to connect people who have behavioral health disorders with services before they enter the criminal justice system. And so really looking at the community services that are available, are there crisis lines that people can call to find the right services, and what is that crisis care and behavioral health continuum in our community? So some of the things, um, best practices at this intercept involve community behavioral health services, crisis responses, and deflection. So what's the difference between deflection and diversion? Hopefully people know this, but deflection is prior to court involvement, prior to the arrest. Can law enforcement take someone um, and de deflect them to something else within the community and not arrest them? Um, so we have some really good examples here. We have a continuum of behavioral health services, crisis lines, warm lines, 988, which um, is a soft implementation is coming up this month in a few days, uh, living room models, uh, crisis centers, crisis stabilization centers, mobile crisis teams, so all of these pieces. Then we look, well, this got moved in the PowerPoint. So this was about what I was talking about. This is the overall view. <laughs> Intercept one, I wondered where that went. Um, intercept one looks um, at law enforcement. Um, what are some of those best practices that exist here um, where our primary, we can aid those who are first responders, law enforcement, um, emergency response, EMTs, uh, fire. Um, what is their first responder training that they're receiving? Are they receiving information and training about um, behavioral health issues, um, about what diversion or deflection options that they have in the community? Um, are there mobile crisis teams that are set up? Um, are there pre-arrest and pre-booking diversion options? So making sure people um, have crisis intervention team training. Um, so understanding how to, to um, de-escalate people when they encounter them and knowing what's available in the community to, to help deflect them. Co-response teams, this is where um, you have law enforcement and behavioral health personnel going out to, the, um, uh, to a crisis at the same time together um, and to help work and respond and get the services that are needed. Um, and throughout all of this, very, very important data sharing are our systems, are our partners that are collecting data, are we sharing it? Are we moving it forward? So if we have, um, people have heard of the Stepping Up Initiative. Um, so we have law enforcement in jails identifying those with behavioral health issues, mental health issues. Are we keeping that information in that system? Are we passing it forward so that the courts can use that information? Can we make good decisions moving forward? Can we build upon that data? So making sure we're collecting the data, for behavioral health, and are we then sharing that information? All very important pieces. Um, intercept two. Um, so this is once an individual is arrested, um, they've moved into intercept two, um, and this is where they can be t detained. So um, in, uh, initial detention, first appearance, this piece, very important. As soon as possible, we need to be able to identify people. We need to be able to screen them for the needs that they have, whether it's a risk need screening, uh, a risk and need screening. So looking at what risks 
they um, uh, may pose so we can make good bail decisions um, if we have bail, um, and what are their needs so we can um, uh, appropriately connect them to the right services in the community, so conditions of release. Uh, so looking at screening and assessment as soon as possible, um, diversion, and pretrial orders. Um, so making sure that we have um, a, a screening tools that are implemented within our jails. Does everyone receive a brief jail mental health screen? Um, do they receive a quick trauma screen um, or substance use screen? Uh, looking at that information sharing, as I stated, pretrial supervision and diversion options, and po post-booking release. Um, we have a, a very strong effort going on about pretrial release in our country and what those conditions should look like, what bond conditions, but releases. Um, so making sure people get to the treatment. And not only is it about making sure we have people getting to the treatment, but making sure we have people help them get to it. Are there warm handoffs? Are there linkages to those things? Because we know from our experience that people with behavioral health issues don't always make it to where we want them to go. So how do we help facilitate those pieces? It gets us to intercept three with best, um, and this is about people um, with behavioral health disorders who have not yet been diverted or def uh, from our system. They often end up, end up spending um, longer time in custody. Um, our justice system does not know what to, to do at this point. Um, and um, in, so instead, we think it's a safety issue and we keep people in custody. Um, this is not the right answer. We know that people um, need to be connected uh, who have any sort of connections in our community. The longer we keep them in custody, um, the worse the outcomes are for them. And this is after keeping them in custody for five days is the research. Um, but we also know that those with behavioral health issues exas have exasperated this, right? They have connections that they need to community supports, to treatments, to medications, and all of those things can be interrupted by um, being in placed in custody. So really looking at um, some of the best practices here, really thinking about case flow management, thinking about competency and restoration issues. Um, and we're gonna talk, the next thing I'm talking about is what can we do about these things, right? How can we look at the current landscape to identify what we're doing, but then what are some innovative things to, to take to this next level? Looking at court liaisons, um, prosecution, criminal defense, um, uh, building in uh, pieces with that, um, treatment courts, and diversion alternatives. So thinking about this, instead of um, uh, having people stay in custody, we often know that state hospitals have a long wait list. Um, evaluations take a long time to do. Someone charged with a misdemeanor or a nonviolent offense, can we, can we not charge them? Can we take them to community outpatient treatment? Or if, if we insist on doing that, um, and please know I was a prosecutor for 16 years when I say this, um, can we... Can we divert them to our community to get the treatment they need? And if not, can we do outpatient fitness restoration? Because it does a couple things, right? It ties them to those community resources, and um, it hopefully also works with housing and those linkages to the supports that they're going to need. We also know that most community um, competency statutes do not talk about treatment. They talk about restoration so people understand the process. And um, that's not helping with treatment and not helping people um, recover. So let's talk about intercept four. This is about, um, we plan for transition. This is reentry from jails and from prisons um, and making sure that people are in a position that they can be successful. So best practices look at um, benefit enrollment, co-location of services, so people don't have to deal with transportation issues, coordination of those services, peer supports, transition plans. How does someone transition to those new things having been disconnected from them for so long? Uh, you see some examples up here. Um, really talking about warm handoffs in reach into jails and prisons to start working on those transition plans and those connections, uh, building those relationships, community reentry programs, um, medication prescriptions of, upon release, making sure your state doesn't have a um, stopping of Medicaid benefits and it's only a maybe a... Um, uh, suspension. suspension, thank you, suspension of that. Um, so really working with all of those ideas and how to do that. 
Intercept 5, um, this is where um, we had those community supervisions, um, community corrections, so parole and probation working with those in our community, making sure that we have risk need responsivity issues, that we're, we're really looking at what people need um, and, and how to best serve that to them, making sure that those that are supervising have a specialized caseload. It's a reduced caseload with training so they know how to adequately work with the population um, and looking at team-based um, programming. Um, we have to have community partnerships. We cannot do this alone. Sequential Intercept Model is really good about doing this and bringing the right stakeholders together to really talk about what services and supports people need and how to give those wraparound pieces and making sure you have the right people that you're talking to to make sure that those things are in line. Looking at the social determinants of health, I had no clue what this was for the longest time, but if you don't know what this is, look at look this up. Um, this is about what people need to be successful and thrive in our communities. Um, we need to, People can't think about treatment if they don't have their basic needs met. Do I know where I'm sleeping tonight? Do I have food in my stomach? Do I have the medications I need so I can focus and do the things I need? What do people need to be successful? Um, looking at individual placement and supports, um, specific evidence-based practices, assertive community treatment, forensic commu assertive community treatment are specific evidence-based practices, cognitive behavioral practices that the people need. So we have to start thinking and doing things differently, please. Arrest, incarcerate, arrest. I cannot tell you, I am passionate about this because as a prosecutor, I saw the same people over and over and over. And all I did was give them a longer criminal history. It did nothing to help them because eventually they landed in jail or prison. Um, and so we have to start thinking about doing these things differently. What do people need to be successful in our communities? Because ultimately they are a reflection. They are where we live. They are, they are our community. They're a part of our community and it makes us all better as a whole. So let's look at some of the resources and different ways to start thinking about this. Um, you're going to find these resources in the NACAM Behavioral Health Guide, which you know how to find now, right? Um, there are links in there to all of these things that I'm talking about um, and more. Um, you can also go to the National Center for State Courts Behavioral Health and State Courts website, um, just at ncsc.org slash behavioral health, and it has a wealth of resources. You have three to four years of a state ta a national task force putting together lots of deliverables for you. Um, so it's a great wealth of information. Identifying access to treatment gaps and opportunities is critical toward improving a community-wide response to the behavioral health needs of vulnerable populations. Addressing behavioral health needs is most effective through an interdisciplinary approach, this collaborative approach, which utilizes a behavioral health continuum of care model. We, as court systems, are one of the largest refers to treatment. How can we not be having conversations between courts and treatment providers to provide and create this community of treatment that we all need? If we don't have this behavioral health continuum of care, courts have no place or not the appropriate place to refer people. Um, this model supports delivery of care through community practices and partnerships and provides services along a continuum of um, covering education, prevention, treatment, and recovery. We need meaningful system change that requires leadership. So I talked about that at the beginning very briefly. Collaborative efforts among justice, mental health, and public system partners are essential to respond to individuals who s frequently cycle through systems. Court leaders are well positioned to convene stakeholders to implement effective responses to reduce the negative impacts on our courts. Um, we do need meaningful system change, just not system change. Um, courts and judges in particular can bring those groups together to develop consensus and provide action. Um, this will look different in each of our communities. Yes, we need to do this on state levels, but this is a community by community response that we really need to assess and look at uh, to make sure that we know. Um, it, we have to explore person-centered justice. This is very important. What do people need to be um, healthy and happy in our communities? We need to look at early intervention and case flow management practices. You heard what Paul said in the statistics he provided. 
We have a case management system that is developed for 30% of the population. We have 70% of those coming through our justice system that have behavioral health issues, but we do not look at those behavioral health issues and what people need as they move through our system and how to effectively manage those cases. So we need to think differently about it. Um, and there's lots of resources on, on those two sites uh, that, that do talk about that. Um, this is a framework that the National Task Force has, has talked about, redefining the collaborative court and community response with four pillars and looking at case management and things that need to be different from prosecution diversion efforts, from defense practices, um, through court system practices. So just really take a look at that. Um, it's something I know I got to keep moving here. Um, we also have some really some guiding principles for community responses, um, engaging all judges uh, to use their leadership role, developing new case law management systems, facilitating evidence-based practices, making sure those things that we're doing are based in evidence for the population we're using them for, um, identify opportunities to address uh, systemic racism. We know that certain populations have, um, when thinking about social determinants of health, poverty plays a factor, race plays a factor, and we need to address those things. Adhere to principles um, of, uh, of due process, procedural fairness, transparency, and equal access to justice. Develop trauma-informed and person-centered responses and practices. Promote individual attention to each case and each person. This is not a court call that we just need to get through cases. These are people standing in front of us. And I told my brand new prosecutors when they came into the office that the most important courtroom was our traffic courtroom because every segment of our population came into that courtroom. And we needed to be sensitive to that. And that is their impression of what the court system is. Well, guess what? I can't, and if any of you do uh, treatment courts, how many times have you heard from one of the participants that no one's ever explained this to me before? I truly actually feel like you care about this. Why are we only doing them in one piece of it? Treatment courts are great, but they, they work with a small portion. And so why are we not treating everyone that stands in front of the court and with us in the same manner um, and working with that? We need to um, listen. We need to treat people with respect and dignity that goes along with, we need to listen to them. We need to gather input. Um, ensure that new models of collaboration and community case flow um, are implemented, design and foster timely, effective court and community procedures, and leverage and share resources. We cannot silo anymore. Um, I, we are trying to treat people with co-occurring disorders that have separate funding systems and separate silos to treat people. It's like splitting the baby in half and saying you go here for one thing and you go here for something else when we have to treat the whole person together. And so we need to really think differently about how we're doing that. Um, principles of community-based um, behavioral health services for individuals involved in the justice system. We have alternative pathways for treatment and recovery. So there's lots of resources that are out there to keep doing this. Um, and as I said, with competency, there's competency recommendations that are coming out nationally that we need to rethink how we're doing this. Um, we need to look at our statutes. We need to look um, at who we're sending through our competency system and really what the outcome is that we want. Um, I listened to a judge speak the other day. They have a very long competency statute um, where they can hold someone up to three years on a felony in for competency, for competency, not for the charge, for competency. The person was held for three years, was brought back, the case was dismissed, and they were released into the community with what? No treatment. Do you know how much that cost? $1.6 million for one person. What can we do different with that money if we work together to share resources, to collaborate and actually bring those systems and silos together to do this in a much better way. So anyway, just some food for thought for all of you guys. I'm gonna pass it over to Don. Thank you, thanks Michelle. Uh, just one more comment because this whole competency thing is, is something I'm, I'm very involved in right now in, in our state. And really looking at it at the misdemeanor level is becoming very crucial. Uh, because, you know, she mentioned the felony three years. Well, guess what? Individuals at a misdemeanor level, often the competency evaluation process is the same as a felony level. They don't change it for misdemeanors. 
So how do you deal with that? And if you got somebody on misdemeanor, maybe in there for maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe three months, it may not be years, but it's often months at a time on a misdemeanor level, and the same thing happens. They're kicked out. They, there's no follow through. There's no uh, treatment, all that kind of thing. So it's a very crucial thing, and I think it's something that's going to be part of uh, part of the dialogue moving forward in a, in a real critical way uh, over the next few years. Education and training, about. Almost 30 years ago, I first became a trial court administrator. I, it, was a great, it was a great gig. I loved it. However, it was very quickly into, into my tenure uh, that I realized I was the expert. Now, I wasn't, but I was expected to be, right? I was supposed to know everything about IT systems. I was supposed to know about facilities and budget and finance stuff. Now, now fortunately... I, I, had, uh, I had some great support. Uh, the Institute for, for Court Management, ICM classes came in, became a fellow. I learned an awful lot on the job. I had exposure at felony, at misdemeanor, across the board. I got a lot of information. But you know what area I realized I had absolutely no training about? Behavioral health. Recognizing symptoms between an individual who is going through alcohol withdrawal versus that his schizophrenia versus that who's bipolar. I had no idea. That was not my background. That was not my experience. That was not my education. And yet we had these individuals coming into the system every day. It wasn't unusual to have them there. And every day these individuals came in and we as court professionals were expected to respond, to treat, to be empathetic, and to know what to do. We had no clue. I'll tell you one story. I had an individual come in. Uh, I worked in a court that was located next to the largest Indian reservation in the United States. We had an individual came in from the Indian reservation, came into town, was arrested. He was deaf and dumb. He could not speak. Not, not only just couldn't speak Navajo, he couldn't speak English. He couldn't speak any language, couldn't speak, and he was deaf. But because he grew up out on the reservation, he did not know American Sign Language. He was arrested on a misdemeanor charge, spent a lot of time in jail. What do you do with an individual like that? We discovered that he was also abused, that he also had uh, prenatal alcohol syndrome. He had all these kind of things that were going on in his mind, uh, and he could not communicate. We, we didn't know what to do. How do you treat somebody who is mentally ill, so heavily disabled that they can't even function, uh, and we had no expertise, we had no knowledge what to do with this person? Now, eventually, we worked out a plan where we got some, we got some, <laughs> we finally got some professionals to come in. They helped us out. We worked out, but it was very, very intensive and very, very extensive for this one person to find out what to do and how to manage and treat that person. And yet we're faced with these individuals every day, and not just one instance, but often dozens in the course of a day. So how do we work? How do we treat? Learning about the issues, learning about what mental health, behavioral health involves is a crucial part of this for court professionals, not just judges. I ran into some court ministries, oh, that's the judge's issue. They got to deal with that uh, at the judicial level because they're the ones dealing with the person in the courtroom. I hate to break it to you, but if you run a court, you're going to have to figure out programs to work with these individuals in your court system, not just in the courtroom. So in the guide that we developed, we kind of divided things up here into a couple different, uh, couple different areas. First is the case focused mental health training, and the second is the person-focused mental health training. We did it this way to kind of give some <clears throat> guidance as to how to organize and look at some of the training uh, that you might want to consider and put out there. First, the case-focused mental health training. You can do it. There's several different ways you can divide up the case focus. You can do it by case type, right? You can look at felony, misdemeanor, competency to stand trial, mental and behavioral health courts, uh, you know, these include uh, DUI drug courts, these include veteran courts, veterans courts, community courts, <coughs> excuse me, all kinds of courts out there that focus on these issues. Often I've, I've, I've come across uh, uh, courts that say, well, yeah, we have a mental health court. So the minute you start talking about mental health, they automatically think, oh, you know, we've got a mental health court, so everything goes in there, right? No, it doesn't, does it? 
It doesn't. You have certain specific guidelines and issues of individuals who go into your mental health court, but that's a small percentage of the individuals that are dealing with these issues. So you cannot isolate it and say, well, you got a mental health court, so therefore we've covered it, right? It doesn't work that way. You have other cases, family, child welfare, guardianship, conservatorship, prograde, civil, civil commitment cases, which are obviously mental, mental health, but they cover all these things. Have you ever been in a domestic relations trial where one party claims the other one's insane? Yeah, it happens all the time. So they bring in the professionals. They do an evaluation. Who's going to evaluate that evaluation? How is that evaluation going to be done? Right? I mean, all these things relate back to an individual's mental health. There is no area, I don't care what area you work in, you might work in civil traffic, ain't, <laughs> there is no area in the justice system that is not touched and does not deal with individuals who struggle with mental health, period. So this covers everywhere. And when you look at it, you may have a different response in different areas. For example, you may treat misdemeanor cases different than you're going to treat felony cases, different, obviously, than civil or probate cases. These are all things that you're going to have to look and consider. So when you're considering training, look at the case types that you're specifically dealing with. Don't isolate it into just one area like your mental health court. Make sure it's encompassing all other areas. Some examples of training uh, by case type. I apologize that these are Arizona-centric uh, things, but it's, it's where I'm my knowledge is. So uh, we have a, in Arizona, we have an involuntary treatment process. We have this set up for both practitioners and individuals who want to do it outside on a per, per basis. Uh, we have court-ordered evaluations, uh, court-ordered treatments. We have uh, the National Center has a new model for collaborative court and community uh, man, case management. Pa Patty, would you stand up? See, I'm going to make you stand up right here. See, Patty's running. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Patty's running the, the group with CCJ Costco, who's helping put this together. Uh, it, it's, still, it's still in progress, but you can see the work that's been done in that area so far. How to look at case management from a person-centered viewpoint, rather than just the case. Remember, we, we developed for the last 100 years, we've been developing case management processes, right? But it's all about the case. How to move the case through the system. And what we're talking about now is to say, how do we deal with the person in the system? That doesn't mean we ignore things like time to disposition and clearance rate. We, yeah, we pay attention to those things. But we do it in light of the fact that there is an individual, not just a case, a, a stack of papers that we're trying to deal with. There's a person behind that we work with. So the first case-focused mental health, you can do it by case type. You can also do it by case process. So here's just an example. I'm going to give a bunch of these here. Uh, you know, you can do behavioral health triage. You can, uh, you know, prosecution alternatives. You can look at all kinds of case processes here, right? Things like reentry practices, treatment courts is there. But again, you'll notice that treatment courts is just one of those things. It's not the whole thing. It's one of the options. All right, and all these are listed in, in the guides, and, and they all have links to other, other resources and so forth. So I encourage you to download the guide, go to the links, start looking at some of these things and see. Uh, trauma and trauma informed responses. Um, this, how do you respond to individual who not only has had trauma in their past, but also may have trauma in the present and what's going on? Have you ever had somebody break down in a courtroom? Does that ever happen? Somebody actually just loses it right in your courthouse. Doesn't have to be in the courtroom, it can be out in the lobby, right? If you've been in the system for more than, oh, I'd say probably six months, <laughs> you've seen this and experienced this. If you've had any kind of volume going through your courthouse, you know that this happens. How do you respond? How does your staff respond, right? This is something that we should be training for. We should be able to know these things. So you can look at your case management process and say, okay, at this point in the process, remember Michelle just went through the, the intercept points, right? Let's break it down a little further because one of those was the case process that's, that's covered by the court. But you can start to break that down even further in different steps within that case process, right? 
at the beginning, middle, and end of a case. How do you respond? How do you work? How do you deal with that? And you manage that case based upon the needs of the individual, not just the case, but the individual in that case. <clears throat> Third area might, under case focus, be for supporting entities. You know, it'd be nice if, if we could control everything, but we don't. We're part of a system. We're part of a justice system. And therefore, we have law enforcement. We have, uh, we have in some areas, probation is a separate entity. You have uh, jails and prisons. Uh, you have prosecutors and defense attorneys. You have mental health professionals themselves. You ever worked with, I mean, we have this funny thing. People come into the courthouse and they're professional. We think, well, they should know what they're doing, right? <laughs> you know what? The fact that you don't know anything about their area probably means they don't know anything about what your area is. You just can't assume that. So you need to train them. You need to help them understand the process so that they know what's going on. So you need to develop training programs to help these individuals know what is expected in the courtroom, specifically in relationship to those cases, to those individuals that have a mental illness that you're working with. That's an area of focus that you need to have and develop. So, case-focused mental health, person-focused mental health training. I'm gonna talk about this a minute. First, I'm gonna show you a little clip now. I'll come back to this. Oh, where's this? Is it not in here? I'm, I'm, I'm a couple screens. Okay, then I'll tell you what. I'm going to go back. I thought it was at this screen. My mistake. All right. Let's talk a little bit about person. Before I show you this little clip, let's talk <clears throat> a little about person-focused mental health training. You can center your training around cases, right? But that's not the only option here. You have to deal with people. And again, if you're going to develop a person-centered case management system, you know how, how you have to deal with individuals. Everybody's different, aren't they? There's no t and you know what? It would be nice if there was only one type of mental illness. Wouldn't that be nice? One type of behavioral health. If you've worked in the system, you know that an individual who's dealing with certain types of drugs, Addictions here are not the same as the person there. That trauma by one individual here is not the same trauma experienced by another person there. Everybody comes from a different place. So when you're focused on your person-focused mental health training, you need to focus on the personal characteristics of those in this population, those who work with the population and those within the population. You need to have some understanding of mental illness. When I first began to work in this area, this was, a, this was a struggle for me. It wasn't my area of expertise. Well, I don't know. What do I know about this thing? But I, certainly, I quickly learned that I needed to have some understanding to be able to at least converse intelligently with other professionals in this area. Plus, you needed to have it to be able to focus on the individual and have an understanding. Is this person just mad? Are they drunk? Or are they mentally ill? Sometimes those are hard to distinguish between them. You know, they're angry. They may be lashing out. Are they lashing out rationally or irrationally? Can you determine the basis of that? And yet often our response is always the same. So you need to focus on the personal characteristics. You need to avoid re-traumatizing. You think it's, it's traumatizing to get arrested? Yeah, sure it is. An individual who's struggling with understanding the reality they're facing and communication, because that's often one of the big things, and we'll talk a little bit more about communication in a few minutes, but communication becomes a central point in dealing with these individuals who are struggling with mental illness because their view of what's going on is different than your view. And you don't even have to deal with people who are mentally ill to see this. Ever had somebody come to the counter, somebody come into your courthouse, somebody come uh, into a courtroom who thinks the system works this way, right? Thinks the system is supposed to do this for them. And they're wrong. It's doing this. Well, it's the same thing. 
It's just maybe on a different level, in a different fashion, in a different way. And you need to avoid and understand the empathy to avoid re-traumatizing these individuals and re-victimizing them. <clears throat> Remember that mental health is individual in nature, just like we all are. There are no two situations that are the same. There are no two causes that are the same. There often are symptoms that are similar, but they will manifest themselves in different ways. So understand that there is no common one size fits all when it comes to this. And seek to develop common terminology. This is crucial when you're working with mental health professionals in your area of expertise. They will come in and they will spout certain things and you'll just be going, yeah, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, sure, sure. And you have no clue what they're talking about. That was, that was me, you know? And I said, wait a minute, what do you mean? when you say this, and when you're talking about this kind of treatment option, or when you're talking about this type of, uh, this type of, uh, of process you want to put them through, or this type of evaluation. We had a professor come in and do an evaluation of evaluations, okay? Uh, what are the good, I mean, there's like 360 different evaluations being used in the state of Arizona for those who had a mental illness, right? You wonder how many of them were crap? About 75, yeah, about 75% of them, right. And, and, and she went through this forensic study of showing how most of these things are garbage. Now, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're presented to, <coughs> to a judge up on the bench. And the judge looks at this. Is he, is he a professional to be able to evaluate and understand which ones are good and bad? They're not going to do it. They're just taking the word of the person standing before them, right? And... You never know where that's coming from. I hate to say it, but sometimes certain things happen. For example, I've known mental health professionals, they get a rebate when they use their evaluation process from this one company. They would provide rebates. Well, well, cool, I get extra money. Now, it may be garbage, but I get extra money. So you have to be aware of these things. Understand the common terminology, understand what's being done in your system. Don't take it for granted because it may not be what you want. And you will not come up with the outcomes you want if you don't have that. And understand communication style. This is both for the individual who is coming into the system as well as for the other professionals you're working with. They have a different communication. <clears throat> you, you guys, you know, you all work with attorneys, right? Don't, attorneys have a certain language. My undergraduate work was in engineering. Right? So I, I can talk to an engineer because I understand their language. I can talk to a lawyer because I understand their language. Talk to judges because I understand their language. Can you talk to a mental health professional? Do you understand their language? Somebody who's mentally ill. Can you understand what they're saying? All right. So again, uh, uh, we have several different uh, uh, areas here. Person-focused mental health training includes recognition of me mental illness. Can you recognize somebody who is mentally ill? Can you at least get a clue that maybe something's not right here and that this needs to have some sort of intervention going on beyond just treating the case like every other case? Can you respond to those who have a mental illness? How do you, how do you calm somebody down? If somebody has, is having a psychotic break, how do you deal with that? Do you just call the police? That's the most common response, right? Call the police. Do you have somebody that you can call to help with the process? Can you make sure you're not escalating the process through what you're saying and doing? You have to be able to focus on the person and have enough understanding to know how to then deal with that person and respond to them in an appropriate fashion. It's crucial. If 70% of the people coming into the system are having behavioral health issues, we better learn how to speak their language. We don't. It's necessary that we do. Okay? So we need to find new ways to communicate. Uh, again, you, you have people who you might, you, you could say things. You know how long it took? Because we figured this out one time. When we hired a new, new clerk, we figured out it took us six months before they become productive. You want to know why? because it took him six months to figure out what the heck we were talking about. Because we would use all of our nice language and lingo and blah, blah, blah. And I tell you, I, I remember I sat behind one of my clerks one time who's working with an individual, and the person would ask him a question. They would answer the question. They'd get asked, they'd answer the question, and the person says, okay, I really didn't understand that. So 
what do you mean? Blah, 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 blah. You know what the clerk would do? Say exactly the same words in exactly the same way, with, uh, like, like they were a machine. They're just cranking it through. And the person would go, okay, I, I don't get that. And then what do you mean? Well, then guess what they do the third time? Exactly the same words. Exactly. The same. You know, we find new roads to communicate. It may not be what we're used to. It may not be what we're comfortable with, but we need to find those and find avenues of communication. We need to have the trauma-informed courtroom. Trauma is very individual. You know, studies show trauma is just pervasive, particularly in certain, uh, certain um, socioeconomic groups, that you find trauma is a critical part. And you need to be informed about how to have a safe environment in which to do. We need to have professional re resiliency. We need to be able to, to, to deal with these things and find ways for ourselves to bounce back and be part of it. And we need to create empathetic leadership. We need to find ways. Families can come into the court. It's not just the, the defendant, right? It's not just the individual. It's the families. We need to find new ways to lead within our system to do that. Now, there's a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of things you can, can download and find. I wanted to share just a two-minute example. This is one we did. Uh, we did this in collaboration for the Center for Applied Behavioral Health Policy at Arizona State University. And we developed this, uh, this training for... Um, for uh, judges and court professionals to help understand uh, what it's about. Uh, the National Center has put this online, so it's available, but I wanted to just show you a quick. And if you see my little, if you see the mouse moving along the bottom of this here, that's, that's me moving this forward, because this is a self-paced process. You can replay each page again and again and again. You can move forward, you can stop at any point, and you can see, I'm just moving through it here. But let's see if this works. Is there any, there should be uh, audio coming up here. Do you have audio with that? I'm hearing no audio. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to talk for another minute and stop that. Is it, do we not get the audio there? It should be up there. Nope, okay. Since I'm not hearing it. Four steps oh, there's some more effectively approaching an individual who may have a mental illness or who may be experiencing short-term symptoms related to mental health. Step one is to recognize common mental health disorders. Step two is to demonstrate empathy. Step three is to notice and respond. Step four is to engage and de-escalate. And we'd even talk about de-escalation techniques. Introduction thing and do. prevalence. These mental health disorders cause disruption in an individual's life. These individuals might seem like they are pushing away support, but they need it when symptoms are heightened. Mental illnesses are health conditions involving changes in emotions, thinking, or behavior, sometimes a combination of these. Mental illnesses are associated with distress and or problems functioning in social, work, family, or daily activities. <clears throat> So, you get an idea here of what this, uh, what this kind of thing does. It gives you a, a, a tool that you can use for anybody, right? It, you can then put forth and train them to begin to understand the issues involved, to begin to be empathetic, to begin to, to do that. Now, it, it's, it's, again, uh, it's a lot of work here. We have a long way to go. But I think, I think we can make some great strides if we understand that focusing on person-centered processes is crucial, and not just the case processes, but moving it forward to person-centered. All right, there we go. I'm going to turn it over to Greg here for now. All right. Well, as a uh, as a sitting trial court administrator, and you know, trying to digest all this material that you've just heard, and you're going to see some redundancies here, so I'll go whip through some of that. But so, how do you actually do this where you are, right? Because nobody has that system has everything. Nobody has all the money in the world, and you may be someone who's you know concentrated in family court, criminal court, and as Don said, and is very right, what you're going to do in each of these courts is gonna be very different, right? But the first thing you wanna do is try and convene some system partners together, and how are you gonna do that? Well, first you have to make the argument for this. 
You've got to get those stats that are in this guide, and you've got to get them in front of the right people. And the right person at, at the moment is probably your, your chief judge, presiding judge, assignment judge, whatever you want to call them. One in five people in the United States with a mental illness, one in 20 with a serious mental illness. I would, until we started doing this, I would never have guessed that. I mean, I, I would assume it's out there, but that prevalent, I would never have thought that. The amount of folks in jail with it, four to six times higher than the general population, that's striking. Some of us may know that or at least think that, but again, if you're trying to get someone on board, these are the sort of things you need to point out to them. And then I think it's really uh, key, the 70% of justice-involved youth suffering from a mental health disorder. That's really alarming, right? If anybody's ever worked with juveniles and all the things going on in their lives, I, I again, would not have guessed that. I mean, maybe it's intuitive after you hear it, but you've got to get people to hear this. And you've got to get the right people to hear it because we may, everybody in this room may think that this is a major issue. Your judge may, may not, you never know. Your system partners, who knows? It's very much dependent on where you are. So, and that's part of the problem, that's part of the way about getting the system of collaboration. Judges have that power to convene, we call it. Um, ultimately, I've seen, you know, usually you can get a pretty good initial meeting if you're starting a new initiative. Judge so-and-so, you know, calls out a whole bunch of folks, they all come. But boy, you better perform in that first meeting, second meeting, because if you don't, this is going to drift off fast, and to try to get this going again years later, believe me, it's very difficult. Um, so kind of got to get on the ground running. You got to get people to understand what's going on as far as the issues. And then um, <clears throat> this last piece here. You need some kind of leadership. Now, we're, we're advocating the mental, the task force is advocating for a state-level mental health advocate or someone inv involved with all this. That makes all the sense in the world. But again, you're from whatever jurisdiction you're in, but you need someone focused on it day in and day out. If you have drug court, likely you have a drug court liaison whose job is drug court. That's all they do. Well, you need somebody like that for this if it's going to go anywhere. All right? By the way, we are getting crunched for time. We did want questions. You can stop me at any moment and ask any question you want, and I'll tell you which person will answer it, okay? <laughs> All right. So if you've, done, if you've done anything with criminal justice reform, if you've been involved with bail reform, you know the job one is getting people out of jail. It's not because they're you know, guilty or not guilty. That would be determined later. It's the fact of the matter that when you're in jail, it's the country song. You're losing your job, you're losing your wife, you're losing your family. It's just not where people need to be. And if you've got mental illness, believe me, it can't be any better for you. Is your anxiety gonna go up? Are you, your depression gonna get worse? I would imagine so. And if you had any connection to any kind of services, that connection is lost. In fact, one of the things that's suggested in the literature is, if possible, Try to get the medications this person was on into the jail so they have them there. Uh, so we really do want you to consider implementing bail reform because if they're out on the street, if they're back with their families, you've got a better chance to get them connected to services while their case is moving along. All right? If you can't do that, then you're going to have to work with those system partners, get them together, and really work to get adequate services in jails. I don't know what percentage of jails have adequate services. I'm not even sure I want to guess because it's probably not what we would want, right? So that's something you need to work on as well. And then we talked a couple of times about expediting um, or talking about the civil commitment process and how long that can take. Three years, you were saying, right, in the one case? No matter what, this needs to be moved up fast. <laughs> and I am getting the yellow card. Um, so. Whatever process you've got, if you could make a small mental health caseload, if you could make a, even if you haven't got a lot of money or time, if you're in family court, maybe there's a judge who will get the multiple, these cases and you give them a little extra time. You work with the prosecutor's office, get these a little bit more expedited. Get them through the system so they can get disposed and again, connected with the, all the, the uh, services that they need. Training. Well, we've already talked about a ton of training. So, and obviously it's for different people in the system. All right. And since you've heard about that, I'm going to keep rolling. <laughs> if you haven't done a sequential intercept evaluation model, go ahead and do it. 
If you have done it, considering what we just went through in the last three years, it's probably a little stale. People have rotated, services have changed. Even if all the services are still there, they may be being provided in a different way. And that will change what you have going on here. I'm flying because we ain't got much time. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get your partners together, work with them, advocate for them. One of the things that we had in New Jersey, we were one of the early proponents of bail reform. Well, guess who loved it eventually? The county. Because this dropped the jail population 40%. That's money the county's not spending. They loved it. You know, it took a while to get there. But when the funders know they're gonna be saving that money, then they'll be pushing others who might be a little less happy about the changes. And eventually, everybody gets used to the changes no matter what anyway. Sorry, I'm got glasses on and trying to, the slide's a little different from what I was thinking. Okay, so while you have the person, while their case is going on, you wanna connect pretrial services hopefully with um, some kind of peer supports, court liaisons. We don't have the, the money, at least in my court system, to provide a personnel to do what a court liaison does. What they do is they work with a person, figure out what their needs are, get them hooked up with whatever is available in the community, and then they make sure the person you know, has you know, adequate support, see if they need transportation, if there's any barriers, and all that. And then they also report back to the court, to pretrial services, to explain how, what's going on with the person. So it's a great thing to have, but you probably don't have those resources, so you're gonna to need to work with your system partners to hopefully get some kind of grant or just get them to pony up a person. We're getting close to this in my jurisdiction. I can't wait. It's gonna be fantastic. Peer support is also a great thing to have if you can find it. It's basically someone who's gone through all this in their own life, and now they're giving back and working with people in the same situations going on. Treatment courts, mental health court, if you can afford it, fantastic. But again, like Don said, it's not the be all end all for all of the people are involved. And it is labor intensive, it's a resource intensive, but if you can do it, fantastic. And then uh, multi multidisciplinary teams. You guys are probably familiar with what that means. It's you got grab people from the different, your different system partners, and they'll convene on a regular basis to consult over whatever cases you've got going on. It's very helpful. And again, it's a uh, support for pretrial pre services. And if you don't have pretrial services, it's still good support for the judge and others working the case. Once someone has been uh, sentenced to probation, more than likely with this, you're gonna to wanna to have a specialized caseload. I would imagine a good percentage of the, of the uh, probation departments out there do have this already. Um, you also wanna make sure you're using risk-based supervision, which I believe the majority of the jurisdictions are using, but again, that's to lower the risk of um, re-arrest. Uh, so it's important also that that information gets to whoever's treating the person so they know what the criminogenic needs are on top of their mental health situation. And you also, if you've got MDTs, you want to use them in that situation as well, just for an extra help for the probation department. So again, I flew through that, but <laughs> are there any questions with uh, the, the little bit of time we have? Got it? Um, I think this panel was excellent um, and very, very informative, but I can't help but thinking the entire time that you guys were talking um, about what you're talking about being so, so important, but at the same time, just an overall, even I think national mental health crisis where we're talking about like getting people into treatment those sorts of things, but is the treatment available? Is quality treatment available? You see psychiatrists, you know, now just even people with with great insurance that have benefits that they get a 15 minute appointment and it's every six to eight weeks. Is that really something that's going to be benefit 
someone who's, you know, an SMI or something like that. You know, it's to me, and I don't know what the courts can do about it. I feel like this information is excellent and courts should be implementing it. But I do feel as though we're on a nationwide, not to be a downer at the end of the day, like a nationwide nosedive until we treat mental health in a different way. I mean, I, I, I think you're right. <laughs> that, that, that we've got a huge issue and we're not going to solve it in this room. But I think what we're trying to do is dig out a little bit. I mean, clearly, right, right. <laughs> so just like, ev just like every place that um, we, ha we have shortages all over um, regarding our workforce, particularly behavioral health, but we as a system need to advocate for that. We need to help support it. Um, we need to think about telehealth services. Um, we need to think about different ways of providing the services that people need. But yes, we have to encourage, we have to make things easier. Um, you know, so I talked about dual disorder treatment and we are licensing and training people in specifics instead of dual disorder. We gotta start rethinking how we're doing things to make it most efficient, so. And I, this is Walter Thompson. And when you talked about those um, uh, people in our community, um, our, our dedicated public servants, he is one of them. The video you saw at the beginning, he's part of that program, so. Nice. Thanks, Walter. Yes, um, I was just going by what you say is, uh, listening to your question, but you gotta partner up uh, with the community, your community and the judge. And that's what we're doing down in Miami. We're putting that partnership there. I wrote on a note here, I was talking about the peers because we have to go inside the community. Wherever we have uh, any any participants inside that community, we have to go in there also, including the court, uh, court specialists and everybody. So we partner up and then we come back and we get with the judges, we get with the providers, we get with everyone. So they just don't have to be just seen and check the box and say, eight weeks, you come back, now I bill you that. No, it can't be that way. So everything that they're doing is, we actually go through it with them. That's where that, that, that warm handoff, it stays until they're actually able to move themselves. So that's how we work around the whole county of Dade here, because we have to put it that way because we want the people to be helped. And we want everybody to see it that mental illness, you can have someone to hold your hand to help you out and to see what it is. So that's what we do there and that's how we partner up with it. And just to sort of wrap things up for us, you make a very good point. We're really at a starting point many times. You know, there's these, these resources and, and training information and all that is being made available in many cases just to start. Tomorrow morning, I know that Donna pointed out Patty Tobias from the National Center, but Justice Goff, who is with us today too, are going to have a session tomorrow morning to talk about the work of the National Task Force. Lots of resources that are being provided to the core community, but in many cases, as I had mentioned in the opening, some courts have made some changes, but in most of our cases, we're just starting. And so we need to move forward. So you'll hear more from the National Task Force tomorrow. We actually structured this particular session to flow through the, the guide. I opened with some statistics and and Michelle talked about the current landscape and the importance of collaboration and community approach and Don talked about the education and training available and and uh, Greg talked about our pathway forward there's a ton of resources in this guide that flow through all of those sections so I'd encourage you to use that guide as a starting point but again look forward to tomorrow's session of the national task force to share some more in-depth information and and resources Resources, but again, realizing that we're not there. We have a long way to go. So I encourage you to take advantage of the resources that are provided to you. Talk about it in your court system. Talk about it locality to locality, community to community, so we can all make a positive impact and change on this. So thank you. All right.